I was sort of prepared this lessons for next week, for the week after that. But the Lord has different plans, I believe, so we know it's what the Lord plans and not my plans. First Peter chapter 18, verse 30 is where we'll be tonight. First Kings chapter 18, verse 30. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Uh, first Kings 18, verse 37, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, of the sons of Jacob, under whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name, and with stones, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And they decrypt about the altar that greater would con contain two blessings of seed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help tonight in God's revelation. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this day, Lord, thank you for the to allow us to gather here, Father, to hear your word and to worship you and to praise you together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray for Sister Tabitha's love, Father, that reach down and touch her and heal her, Father, that we know you can. Be with Brother Eric Brooks and their family, Father, that they glory the loss of a loved one, Father, and give them the comfort that only you can comfort them, Father, with. Lord, I pray for each and every one here, Father, those that are saved, those that we are come closer to you, and those who know here that are lost, Father, just work on their heart and convince them and draw them under the Holy Ghost's conviction power. Show them their need for salvation, Father, that they'll come to light and be born again. Lord, be with me, Father, hiding behind the cross. You know I can't do anything without you. This is not my lady's front door. May we just hear it as yours, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Both of us know the, the situation that was going on here, the story of Elijah calling down the fire of, of God on the sacrifice. Here was the, in, this, in the context of the scripture, it was Elijah when Elijah come three and a half years before and told Ahab that because of your wickedness and because of your wrongs, it's not going to rain until I say so. And then he disappeared, went to the brook of Syria for, until the water ran dry and the ravens fed him there. And then he went on to the, the widow lady there with the leel and the oil that, the leel that fell not. And then he came back on the scene. Uh, he was fishing to come back on the scene and Ahab and Obadiah were was throwing out the search for grass and water for the cattle. I have preached a lesson here before on the Ahab, Obadiah and Elijah, I wish one of you. And Obadiah, we see the land without the, without the compassion of the people. He was more concerned to be with the king and to please him than to pray and ask for God's help. Obadiah was also a priest and a king by just doing what the king said instead of praying and asking God to help. And then Elijah showed up and told Obadiah when he met him on the way and said, Don't tell your king, your master, your lord, that I am here and I will speak to him. Don't tell him I'm here. And Obadiah tried to reason with Elijah and said, No, he's crazy. I ain't going to don't tell him that. Do you not know who I am? He had a little bit of pride in him, wanting Elijah to just go himself, but he was worried that God was going to move him off and have him go somewhere else before Ahab let him. But Elijah assured him to go tell him. And then Ahab let Elijah, and Ahab blamed Elijah for the situation, for the drought of no rain for three and a half years. Ahab, the wicked king that he was, blamed 
Elijah. And Elijah said it was not me, it was you that have caused this problem. Your disobedience to God have caused this situation. So we told him, here's what we'll do. We'll have your, your wives, false prophets, and the, all their so-called God worshipers come up to the Mount Carmel, and we'll meet there, and we'll, we'll get an altar, and we'll put a sacrifice on there, and whoever calls down their God, whoever answers by fire, let him be God. So they did, and the, um, the folk prophet and Abel did their sacrifice, put it on the altar. They were praying and calling for their God, and Elijah started making fun of them and saying, well, maybe you need to call louder to him. Maybe you need to holler at him a little bit louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Or maybe he's sleeping. Or maybe he's on a journey. And perhaps he just can't hear you. So they let him know a little bit longer. They started weeping and cutting themselves, calling out to a, to a false God that wouldn't hear him. To a God that shouldn't hear or answer their prayers. So Elijah told him to quit. He put him off. He first rebuilt the altar. The altar of the Lord was broken down. And before the revival started, and during the revival, this kept sitting on my heart, not the altar or the things that need to be repaired in, in our lives or in the children of God's life. And if these things would be rebuilt in each and every Christian in the United States, in each and every Christian and a true born again believer in, in the whole world, I believe revival would happen. I believe that this world would be turned around. I believe that we had rebuilt, rebuilt some things that we should get a hold of God and God should get a hold of each and every sinner that needs to be saved. I believe that if we rebuild some things that the sinners that turn in week in and week out they go out the same way they turn in. God can reach them. And that the Spirit of God can reach down and commit the heart for those lost. And those that are wandering away from the Lord, He can draw them back in. I know this is a Wednesday crowd, the, the faithful crowd. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Each and every one of us have room to improve. Each and every one of us have room to draw closer to God and let God draw closer to us. God said in the Bible to draw near to, nigh to Him and He'll draw nigh unto us. We first have to make the move. God is waiting for the, us to do it. And if we pay the offer here and listen to leave, leave, heal and restore something that needs to be fixed. A lost person can't repair and heal and offer and these things because they're not, not the Lord. They're not born again. So this is for us, but there's some lost people here too. Just like these people made a choice on who was God, you have that choice to make too. The Lord came and paid the sacrifice for me and you paid for our sins so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. Jesus didn't just come down here and just to have fun for 33 years and, and for the joy of it, go lay himself on a cloth and have nails pierced in his hands. Well, before that, to have uh, get beat literally half the death. If it was me and you, we would have died to take the beating that he took before the Calvary. He didn't just come down here to have fun and say, well, I'm God of our land. You know, he didn't just do that. He came to pay for our sins, for our iniquities, for our trespasses, so that we didn't have to spend eternity in a lake of fire. Amen. He didn't just come down here and say, now if you just be good for the rest of your life, 
even though I, you'll be okay. If it was based on our good work, Brother Dwayne, or our baptism, that thief on the cross would have been in trouble, would he not? If he didn't get baptized. He would have had to get taken off the cross, dumped in water, put back on the cross to die. But when he told the Lord to remember me when you enter in to this, your kingdom, the Lord said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It was today. It was by faith and trust in the Lord as his personal faith. That's your showing today as well. You can either accept him and be born again, be a child of God, or reject him and take a chance. I'm not having that chance again. Before I get to the, to the lessons to the, the faith people, I want to use what else faces. Many, Brother Donnie called me earlier to ask me about the wreck that happened yesterday on the on Grandview Mountain. For I know, there was a man that got killed taking his for what I was told his son to the doctor's appointment in Crossville and got the wreck and died. I don't know where he is today, but he's in one or two places based on his story. He started that morning like any other morning, getting ready, putting clothes on, eating breakfast or whatever he may have done. He didn't know that he was about to go off into eternity. We know not the hour or the day that we're going to go into eternity. So don't wait until it's too late. Now, let's look at some things that we, the children of God, and this is to me, if less is anybody else. First of all, in order to restore and repair things, we must put away things that don't need to be in our lives. We must put off, put off sin, whatever it may be. We must put off envy and pride, hatred, whatever it may be that can hinder me and you. We know our human flesh. We know our, our sin nature. We know our own land. Anytime he can get in there, he's going to get in. So we must put it away. I, I just had one thought I had to put off earlier, a little bit ago. There's somebody here, not here, I'm not going to mention names so that we all don't look at him when he shows up. But a good friend, so I was sitting there wondering where the person was. I like to have a crowd, you know, I like to have people here. So I'm not preaching to myself because I do that every day. So the devil started doing this. He went, hey, he don't like to hear you preach. He don't think you're a good preacher, so he didn't show up. So I should have let that stay in my mind that, hey, he don't want to hear you. So he stayed home and played hooky. And let that eat at me and eat at me. And then I get mad and hateful and angry. And then the next time I see him, go, so you didn't want to come and hear me preach, huh? Well, just for that, next time you show up, I'm going to preach you down, boy. That'd be pride and envy in me, would it not? So, I had to say, Lord, forgive me for that crazy thought. Put that out of me. That's why the Bible says, take every thought cast. I have to work on that one a lot. For some reason, my mind likes to get caught up in that kind of stuff. And I just, I think too much, I believe. So I need to quit thinking. <laughs> but anyway, if we let pride and hatred in our lives, not only will it affect us and sin, but it will affect another person as well. Amen. If we have visitors come in and see each other, you know, somebody give somebody a dirty look and walk by them and not shake their hand, they're not going to feel comfortable. 
Yesterday, uh, Monday, we went to the nursing home and their chaplain was talking to Brother Dwayne and Brother Donnie and Brother Bill when I showed up. And he asked about if he come and visited the church, would we talk to him? You know, I was thinking, I'm sure we would talk to him. He said there'd been a churchy, few churches around this area where he didn't feel welcome. Church house ought to make people feel welcome. Amen. Even the dirtiest sinner in the whole world ought to feel somewhat well. We ought to take them up by the hand and say, we love you, why don't you just sit down by me? Show them some love and compassion. We don't show them love and compassion. That don't mean we let their lifestyle rub off on us and we act like them. What I'm saying, we just treat them with love and respect. Show them the love of God so that God can reach them. So we must put away from saying that will hinder us so we can rebuild what we need to rebuild. First of all, personal sacrifice on the altar of God. Give ourselves back to God. Have you ever gave yourself to God and slowly find yourself taking back what you gave to God? I have. I said, Lord, I'm going to do this more and this more and this. Here I am usually. I'll do it for a week or maybe a month, and all of a sudden that will die down. I take back off of the altar what I gave to the Lord. What that does is it breaks down the altar of personal sacrifice, personal service to God. Psalms are saved to restore me first of all. Psalms 23, verse 3, He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They first gave their selves to the Lord and then gave their selves to the other brothers and sisters of Christ. We say, Here I am, Lord, use me. And then, while you use me, I will help them, help the others serve you as well. I hope this is helping more than me. But this is, I hope this is making sense. Isaiah 6, verse 5 to 8, Then said I, Woe is, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a land of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people, of a people of unclean lips. That's our society, that's our world that we live in each and every day. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then flew one of the seraphim under me, having a live pole in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy fear purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, said me. Most people don't want to say that prayer, hear a lie, feel me, because they think they're going to get called to preach or to be a missionary. God may just want you to just do something for him here. Maybe it's just a witness to somebody, or just to pass out tracts, or be a Sunday school teacher, whatever it may be. It's not just to be a... David said he would have just rather just been a, the door led keeper at the, at the temple, tabernacle, for God. He would rather just be the man standing at the door just to do something for God. Brothers and brothers, here are a personal sacrifice. I hear it by mouth, my eyes, and my heart. Use it for your will. Titus 2, verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, 
having no evil thing to say of you. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may lead us through grace unto the hearers. Proverbs 4, verse 23 and 20 to 25, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a, for, a forward mouth and a perverse lip put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Our speech and the way we talk and the way we act ought to be pleasing to God so much that the sinners and the lost people can't condemn you. They're out there watching each and every step we make. And one little slip, one little mistake, can knock away years of testimony that you had on that person's life. Amen. Psalms 145, verse 18 and 19, The Lord is nigh unto all, all of them. Oh, the one I, sorry, I skipped my part. I was wanting to know through my hand and my feet, and I said I was going to pray. Proverbs 2, verse 20, that thou mayest walk in the way of the good land, of good land, and keep the path of righteousness. Proverbs 4, verse 26 to 27, ponder the feet, the path of thy feet, let all thy ways be established, turn not to the right, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. We're going to keep a straight path, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If we keep looking straight to God, keeping our eyes on Him, and not looking off, we can walk the way we're supposed to walk. We can walk the right path that God wants us to walk. If we look off, we're allowed to wander into something, or fall into a trap the devil laid or the flesh can get an advantage of you. Jacob, come here real quick. I was going to use it later, but come here. Turn around. Walk straight. Sin wants to do this. And the flesh wants you to do this. Look, Jacob. Now walk straight. Walk straight. Can't walk straight looking off to the left or the right. Amen. So if we keep looking at the world, we're not going to live the right path that God wants us to live. If we keep looking at the other people go and do like Peter did when he told when the Lord told him what to do, he said, But what about that land? What about John? The Lord said, Worry about what I said for you to do. And let him, I'm paraphrasing it, I know, and let him worry about what I told him to do. We're to follow the path that God wants us to follow and do the work that God wants us to do and not look off to the world for the world to trip us up and get us into an awful situation we don't want to be in. Then next we need to pray, we build the altar of prayer, getting a hold of God. Call it out to God. Being able to talk to God like he's your very best friend that's sitting right next to you. Talking to God, giving him your whole heart. I'm sure you all have somebody that you can talk to as, you know, one-on-one -on -one that you can just pour out your heart unto. Tell them things that you wouldn't tell somebody else because you have trust in them that they'll pray for you and help you. That's how we're to talk to God. We're to pour out our hearts unto God in prayer. Whatever it may be. It don't have to be something serious like, you know, cancer or whatever, or a trouble or a sin. We just talk to God about what we need. Or maybe we need some strength to go through the day. Pray for brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for the lost. Pray for those that have wandered away from God that have fallen to the wayside. Pray for those that may be one step from falling to the wayside. 
Pray for those that just need prayer. Sometimes just pray for them just because we're supposed to pray. I know they don't need speak, but sometimes I just pray for some people just for the Lord put it on the heart and don't have a clue why I'm praying for them. I just pray, Lord, help them, comfort them, whatever it may be that you that they're dealing with, or whatever it may be, Lord, that you, I don't know why you have to pray for them, just help them. Maybe give them strength to go through the day. Like we pray for Brother Eric and Sister Tabitha, they're both two different situations that both needed prayer. They both needed the comfort of God. They both needed the comfort of brothers and sisters in Christ. Usually, sometimes we just pray and ask, bless the Lord for everything that he has done for us. Just thank him for the goodness and mercy of his grace. I had an incident the other day, which is not a major incident, but I should have easily have broken a window or something. And that would have cost me more by locking my keys in the car. Well, somebody else locked my keys in the car. I love that boy anyway. But anyway, so, <laughs> so, we've all figured it out, trying to figure out how to get this car unlocked without calling a locksmith. But I really didn't want to pay another $40 for another locksmith like I did in April. Poor Bradley, he was with me that day. But as early, I'm not keeping your boys out of my car. <laughs> so, anyway, what I was saying, I was worried about it, saying, Lord, what are we going to do? Brother Steve told me there was a master key out here under the, under the steps here. I thought he was talking about a key. He was talking about a lot. I didn't want to break my window at that time. We used a screwdriver to try to break in it the way my cousin had told my sister that he had done before to his truck. It didn't work. Brother Steve said, why don't you go talk to Brother J.L. Maybe he can help you. I went over there and his lights were off. I thought they were in bed, so I worked on a knock. Then I saw the TV. So I rang the doorbell, and he gave me some keys to go try on the car. So we did, and one of the keys worked. That may not have seen a laser thing, but it was a blessing from God. God let one of them keys work, so that I didn't have to pay however money it was to get a lock clear, or to break out a window and have to pay Lord. So. That wasn't a lazy thing, but it was something that I was wanting, and I asked God to help, and God answered the prayer. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalm 73, verse 28, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all thy work. We also not only need to be sort of pray, the altar of prayer, but also personal fellowship with God, with our Lord. In First John 1, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also they have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Psalm 89, verse 15, Blessed is the people that know the joyful found that they shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. If a joyful sound ought to be heard by the child of God. It, it really drives me crazy to not here. Don't say I'm talking about people here. It drives me crazy when I go somewhere and somebody will say, I love God. 
I, the Lord saved me. And then they asked like it was the end of the world before they got saved. Well, as a saved person, that's like it was the end of the world when you got saved, not going to help a, a lost person. It won't even help a Christian. If we don't have joy in our heart, serving God, fellowship, the lost people are going to say, I don't want their God. I'm just going to enjoy the sinful nature that I'm living in. I'm just going to live it up, if you will, and just have fun. What I do is what I do. We don't need, my sister later called me, I was talking earlier today, and they on the phone or something, and she said I sounded like Eeyore. Eeyore is a very depressing person, animal to listen to. Everything is so sad. Well, the sun is shining today. You know. Well, on December 17, 2006, the Lord saved my soul. Yep, that's so exciting. That don't help nobody. Personal relationship with God, joy in our heart should be hope. It should be a joyful sound that people say, I am a child of the team. I was a sinner, but now I'm, I'm a saved, born in their belief. I was condemned to hell, but now I have a home in heaven waiting for me. I was facing the judgment of everlasting fire, but now I have peace and joy in my heart. I was going to be in outer darkness without God and without family, without brothers and sisters of the Lord. I would have had no brothers and sisters of the Lord. I would have been separated from the family and friends that I love so dear. I wouldn't have gotten to see the very God that created me. But now I'm a born again child of God. Why? Because I trusted him by faith. Because I had faith in the Savior that died for me on the cross. And now we proclaim the gospel with happiness and joy, saying that it should be yours if you receive it today. You don't have to die and go to hell, but Jesus came and suffered for you. Came and gave it all so that you might have a life and have it more abundant. Now we'll get back on the, off of my bunny trail. I chased the rabbit, now I'm going to go back. Revelation 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. And he with me. God will come and have fellowship with you and give you the things that you need for today, give you something to help he will have fellowship with you. I enjoy fellowship with brothers and sisters in the Lord, but I really enjoy fellowship with God. That ought to be our favorite. That ought to be our favorite thing to do on the day. It's just fellowship with God. Have a little talk with Jesus. Well, we ought to have a more than a little talk. We ought to have a lot of talks here with Jesus. You know a day without talking to the Lord, whew, I don't want to see you the next day. You ought to be in a, you might be in a hateful mood. I don't want to see that. After coming, I went to Michigan for a look, and I felt like I was, I don't know how anybody would want to talk to me when I got back. I don't know how Brother Ted and Sister Taylor went for six months or whatever it was. But they went to Sochi, but I didn't find them in any Sochi either. And I was in one state, yet alone however many y'all went to. Separation from worldly living. Separation from living the old lifestyle that we lived in before. First, Second Corinthians 6, verse 14 to 18. 
be not only equally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness, what concord has Christ with the all, and or what part has he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will dwell in them, and will walk, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be like sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. When I read that, here's what I think of. Every time I make a mistake, every time that I feel or have a bad thought, the Holy Spirit and God is, is on the inside, right there with me, and I just have that thought. Or I just acted ugly to somebody, and the Lord's inside of me. And the Bible says over in Ephesians chapter 4, not to dream the Holy Spirit. When we do that, we're dreaming the Holy Spirit. We're displeasing God by the way we act. And the Bible says we ought to live to please the Lord in everything that we do. So when I say to that, it bothers me when I make a mistake. That's why first, I'm glad First John chapter 1 verse 9 is in there. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just as pleases to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our life. And then, not only do we not restore that, we offer to worship the Lord in spirit and truth, our worship, our joy of praising God in the house of God. Oh, I worship at home. We can worship the Lord at home as well while we're studying, praising his name, lifting him up in song and praises in our heart while we're at work and at home and in church, not to sit on the... In, on the on the pew without any joy. I know we all worship different. Some shout, some amen, some cry, some raise their hands, some just smile. But there ought to be a rejoicing in the heart for the child of God. Amen. We ought to be able to say praise the Lord whatever way we do it, whether it's through the tears and in the heart, or a shout, or whatever it may be, just don't roll on the floor like a fish. And I might have to let you saw. But we all know the right way. And that's the way we ought to worship. In spirit and in truth. God is, the Holy Spirit is not going to let you, if we, not going to let you, unless you just ignore him, worship him, worship God the wrong way. You know, we have to willfully worship the wrong way. It has to be the flesh that want to get up and crow like a rooster. But. And then, not only do we got to restore our worship and our prayer and our separation from God, ungodly living and, and worship, we need to rebuild the fellowship of other believers. Restore the unity of the born again children of God. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Finally, be ye all of one line, having compassion one of another. Love with brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise, blessing, knowing that ye are there to call, that ye should inherit a blessing. First Corinthians 1 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, that you may be perfect, joined together in the same line and in the same judgment. First John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, places us above him. We are to love one another Amen. as Christ loved the church. We are to care for one another as he cares for us. There is no thing greater that Satan would love to do than to destroy the Bible and prayer and our lives, but to divide the church. 
If Satan had divided the church, the church will fail. If Satan had given a new hope about the church and divided it, however it may be, getting in our lives, putting things in our heads, causing envy, causing pride, causing division among the brethren, the church will fail. But if the brothers and sisters of Christ come together in the spirit of the Lord and be unified, grow stronger in the Lord, God can do a mighty thing. They do hope that we should. But if they're division, they won't work. The house will fall if they're division. Not only do we got to have unity and fellowship, but they also to exhort one another, encourage each other as we go along in this life. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not for Satan is simple of ourselves together, as the later of some live, but exhorting one another, and so let the Lord as you see today approaching. We are to encourage one another to keep pressing on, keep going on for God, keep pressing toward the light of the Lord, keep going on witnesses for God, keep being a testimony for God, and one day when they get home and receive the prize that he has for us. We don't be able to get there, he'll be able to say, well done, thou faithful child. Well, I don't want to get there and say, well, you, you didn't do a good job. You should have listened to them. You should have just kept on pressing on for God, but you didn't listen, so you fell off the wayside. And not only that, but when one of us falls, we're not to beat them up. We're not to be like, a, like the flock and sisters when they were one dip and just beat them up until they die. We're not to do that. When one of us falls, we're to help them, encourage them. Brother, Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Brother, if the land be overtaken in a fault, ye with our spiritual resources, such the one, in the spirit of meekness. Consider thyself that thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Jacob, Jacob Rain, one more time, will you come up here, please? You're the only one about my height. I'm sorry. You start growing. I won't be picking on you anymore. He associated my height. All right. And he's what, 10, 12? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to use him in a couple of different illustrations. First one, you are born again, aren't you? We're going to say he is. I don't know if he is or not. All right. This one, we're going to make him 18 this time. Okay? 18 years old. He's quit listening to his mom and dad. Don't you ever do it. And he got away from the church, but he didn't listen to the pastor, or his parents, or his grandparents, or his brothers. That's normal, but anyway. <laughs> oh, wow. So, he got into a, started hanging out with that drunk crowd, you know, the ones that like to drink all the time. Jacob started out saying, no, I can't do that. I can't drink. Mom and Dad always said I can't drink. And the Bible says not to be partakers of a strong drink. I can't do that. Oh, come on, Jacob. One drink won't hurt, buddy. Your parents won't never know. And God won't care if you do it one time. Just one time. No, so Jacob take one drink, falls out into the world, and he comes somewhere back into the church house ten years later. And we ought not to go, boy, you shouldn't have done that. Just because of that, you don't need to be in here. Go on, get out of here. No. Jacob, buddy, we know you got out there in the world. We know you fell. You sinned against God. But hey, God will restore that, wipe it away. Just go up to that altar, repent of your sin, get back on the fighting line for God. Get back in there for God, Jacob. Don't let Satan defeat you like that. He just wants to ruin your life. Get back in there. Don't give up. 
Just get that heart right, Jason. It'll be all right. That'll help him more than that first one I just did. Amen. There are too many bleed hearted Christians nowadays that won't do that. They'd rather do the first route and just beat them up, give them a black eye. Now, let's do another one. This one, I've been working on this one. Jacob, he been fighting for God. He been preaching the gospel hard and strong. Been witnessing every day. Now he's getting tired. He's getting weary of the battle. Don't want to go on no more. We're way up here. Jacob landed behind. We can just let him know, let the wolves get a hold of him. Let them folk Dawson people get a hold of him because he's tired. No, we just grab him by the arm and say, Come on, Jacob. Come on. Let's go. Let's press on for God. Press on, child. Press on. Don't give up. You see that lost person out there, Jacob? They need us to press on. They have you see that so well said that lost and died and going to hell? If we give up now, they won't get saved. They have, if we give up now, that soul's going to die and go to hell because we quit on God. They have, you see that saint that just wandered off to the wayside? If we give up, they're going to stay out there. And they're just going to go home out of fellowship with God. Jacob, let's keep going on. Let's keep pressing on for God. You're, you're a little bit younger than me. But I want you and each and every one of us to join together as the child of God. And keep pressing on for God. And when one, one of us blesses up, Jacob, we're going to come and help each other get back on the fighting line for God. We're going to keep challenging each other to move on for God so that the lost people won't die and go to hell. So that those that are wandering away will come back to God, Jacob. We don't want them to die, do we, Jacob? We can't make mistakes, but when we do, Jacob, we're going to get things right. And we're going to get back on the fighting line for God. And we're going to press on until then we go home. Until God says, come home, child, we're going to keep pressing on for God. You should have a seat before I show you today. That goes for each and every one of us. We must press on for God. Quit letting those little things get in our lives that will keep the lost people from getting saved. We must put away our pride and our envy and hatred and whatever it may be and start pressing on for God. And brother, if I get on to the wayside somewhere down the line, somebody straighten me up and don't let me go any farther. And if I see one of you, I want to correct you too in godly love. But as a church, we can say we're going to press on and keep our pastor and brother Steve lifted up and encourage him as well. Let's not give up. There's too much at stake. There's too many souls that need us to be faithful to God. There's too many souls that need to be reached for God to give up. Things that need restored in our lives. We have to restore them. Elijah put it back together. And then he prayed and God brought the fire down from heaven to burn up the sacrifice. Are there things in our life that need to be restored? Is there something in you that may need to fix up a little bit? Or maybe we need to draw closer to God. Or maybe you're just getting tired in the battle and need to be restored and be charged spiritually to press on for God. We know, brothers, we may know people that are that way that need prayer. We know lost people that need to be prayed for. Let's all stand and have prayer to pray and pray. Lost person, Jesus 